If you spend your life keeping score, you're, you're certainly going to be egocentric. You'll probably be unhappy. Hi, I'm Rachel Baumberger from Erdman's Publishing. I'm here today with Craig Hill, who's author of Servant of All, Status, Ambition, and the Way of Jesus. Welcome, Craig. Thank you. Now, this is a book that you've been thinking about writing for a very long time, isn't it? Yeah, I've, I've been in theological education most of my adult life and have worked with pastors at different stages of their career. And so this issue would come up from time to time. And then as I taught New Testament, I kept noticing how frequently the issue arose in the New Testament. So, it, yeah, it's been coming on for a long time. It's a natural, there's a natural tension for, for pastors especially, but anyone who's working in right. leadership where they feel this need to have a drive, to have an ambition for the kingdom that often translates into a personal ambition. Right. What does this look like on the inside for a pastor? Well, I, one of the things the book tries to make clear is that this is absolutely common mm -hmm. for everyone. I mean, there's the whole first major chapter of the book is on biology and you know, the, the, the uh, biology of status amongst social animals, of which we are the number one example. I mean, the most social animal. Uh, so it tries to demystify that and show that that's normal. Uh, but pastors are, are particularly in a bind on this because we're meant to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. We're meant to be servants. Uh, what does it look like to be an ambitious servant or a status conscious servant? And so while pastors have to be ambitious, have to have drive and motivation, if you, uh, ambition can be defined in all sorts of ways, but we have to have energy and drive and motivation. Uh, to admit that you're ambitious uh, or, and that you're driven is deeply problematic because it's such an ambiguous category. So I think pastors in particular are caught on this one. And uh, the problem is that therefore it tends to be repressed and it isn't dealt with honestly and, and therefore it pops up sometimes in very unhealthy ways. Mm -hmm. So there's often a lot of competition amongst pastors. If you ever go to a large pastor's conference, you know in a hurry who the big shots are you know, who has the biggest church, the fastest growing church, the f hottest selling book. Uh, and nevertheless, we're, we pretend this isn't really happening when it is. Mm -hmm. The New Testament has quite a lot to say on this whole question of yeah, status. Um, and it sort of goes against what you say is only natural in yeah. humanity. What is the message of the New Testament and, and how deeply does it run through mm -hmm. um, throughout well, very deeply. I mean, the, the interesting thing about the New Testament is that yeah, if we say this is normal, this is endemic to human beings and human communities, uh, that includes the church, and that includes the church of the first century. Uh, the first century church was quite remarkable, uh, very distinctive in that you had brought together highborn, lowborn, literate, illiterate, Greeks, Romans, Jews, masters, slaves brought together into a community and told to do th very strange things like call each other brother and sister, uh, regard others as better than yourself, Paul says, for instance, in Philippians. Uh, this is not normal <laughs> in the Greco-Roman world. And so uh, every Christian community, to some extent or other, naturally struggled against this. And uh, again and again, you find New Testament authors working with these issues. Uh, often Christologically, a lot of what comes up in the New Testament about Jesus comes up precisely for that reason. I mean, I mentioned Philippians 2, of course, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Um, all of that is preceded by a section on humility and concord and learning to get along. The servant Christology in the Gospel of Mark shows up when the disciples are arguing with, that, with each other about who's greatest. Uh, so you get this again, this pattern again and again in the New Testament where there is division and discord around issues of status. Uh, the hierarchies and status structures of the world are brought into the church. Uh, and what is used to counter it is, mo above all, the example of Jesus as someone who is a servant, the greatest of all who is the servant of all. Mm. So this is not a new issue for the church. Oh this gosh, is something no. something that goes, yeah. and, we, and we can take comfort in that. I oh think. yeah, absolutely. Um, what would you say to a pastor who is sort of struggling with these issues, with this this pressure from from mm. perhaps his own church oh, to yeah. excel, to bring him into a place of status and, and them with? Yeah, these things all get muddled together, don't they? Because yeah. uh, excelling 
doesn't necessarily bring status. I mean, it's, it's a, certain kinds of excellence do, certain kinds don't. Um, often we reward behavior that isn't necessarily godly and, and good behavior within the church. The church is very good at aping the world and cre you know its own star system, status structures. Uh, part of what the book is trying to tell pastors is that, well, to be really blunt, service isn't fair. Uh, it's not fair. If you spend your life keeping score, you're, you're certainly going to be egocentric. You'll probably be unhappy. Um, the thing that, that tends to make people happy is exactly the opposite. It's being set free to serve. It's being self-forgetful. It's losing yourself in something bigger than yourself. So part of what I would tell pastors, and, and again, anyone, the book really is the center right. uh, is for pastors, but the book is for everyone. Part of what I would say is on one level, it's a matter of, uh, well, there's a chapter in the section on ambition that deals with vocation and career. Uh, what so often happens to pastors is they get into ministry and they're driven by a sense of call and vocation. And in five years, 10 years, they shift over to a kind of careerist perspective where they become aware of the ladder and how you climb it and what really counts and what's really valued, what gets attention. Uh, and they shift over to that way of thinking. Uh, it's, it's a recipe for dissatisfaction uh, in the long run and certainly getting your eye off, off the real focus of ministry. So part of it is reconceptualizing what you're doing, getting back to a sense of vocation and calling and service that probably got you in there in the first place. Uh, the other is, so there's a kind of conscious level. There's an unconscious level where you put yourself in the kind of communities and in the kind of Christian relationships where the right sort of behavior is reinforced and not the wrong sort, okay? Uh, so that's really where the book ends, is talking about how do we do this? We do this together. We do this by creating communities in which the widow's might is the thing honored, mm -hmm. for instance, not necessarily the things that our culture around us would honor. How would you describe the way of Jesus in this regard? Well, one of the m most important passages in the New Testament on this subject, and it, so it's the cover of the book, of course, is the foot washing story in John. And the thing that always struck me about that story that's, that's most remarkable about it, and I mentioned this in the book, is the use of the verb to know. Now, Jesus knowing that he'd come from the Father, Jesus knowing that he would go to the Father, etc., takes a towel. Jesus is the only person in the room who knows who he is, and therefore the only one free to serve, uh, not to be defined by the service. And so I think that's, that's key to it. It's often say, uh, the hardest thing is not doing what Jesus commanded. The hardest thing is believing what he believes so that what he commands actually makes sense. Uh, it's having a sense of, of the reality of the reign of God so that uh, it is the pearl of great price. It, you know, it is that thing for which everything else is secondary. If to the extent that we can believe that, we're set free to serve in the world. Uh, to the extent that we don't, we're defined by our service in a way that's unhealthy and that we probably resent. Yeah. That's, that's probably true. What would the world look like if every pastor, every Christian leader, every Christian mm. non-leader <laughs> was freed from this well, that's a desire vision. from status for status. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me back up one okay. step from that. We'll say that in a way I don't think you I don't think you're ever set free from. Mm -hmm. The I mean natural urges uh, are deeply ambiguous, but but mm -hmm. the answer is not repression. I mean, as I say in the book, it's sort of like there's a road with a ditch on either side, and the ditch on one side is indulgence. It's natural, I'm just going to indulge it. That probably will hurt you, it certainly will hurt others if you do that with, with natural impulses. The ditch on the other side is repression. I'm gonna just quash this thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know, like, what is it, hit a mole, bat a mole thing. I'm, <laughs> whack a mole. Whack a mole, thank you very much. <laughs> whack a mole. Um, tell my kids are a little older. Whack a mole. You know, I'm gonna knock this thing down and I'm, I'm gonna quash it. The problem, maybe you'll succeed at that, probably you won't. Probably it will pop up somewhere else uh, in disguise and be even worse. Uh, so there has to be a healthy way of dealing with it uh, in the center. Uh, what if everyone did this? Yeah, it would be glorious. Uh, the people I know who most model this without naming names, uh, but I do know a few, few people to me are just do this brilliantly, are incredibly attractive people. 
I mean, they, they just shine the light of Christ in, in the world, and they win people that you would think nobody could win uh, because of their character. And that's what Jesus was like. I mean, Jesus drew all these people to him. Uh, and I, I think it, it's a marvelous gift if you can do that. But you have to believe something different about, your, about the world, about what gives value, about who you are, who tells you who you are. Uh, I think it says somewhere in the book I mentioned, you know, who signs your report card? You know, who is that significant other whose opinion of you you solicit and believe? Uh, to the extent that God takes that role in your life, you are set free in this world. Uh, but it, it takes real faith because everything around you is telling you the opposite. Mm -hmm. You know, every message around you is telling you it's how you look, what car you drive, how you dress, what title you hold, uh, what church you're the pastor of, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's who defines you or what defines you. And uh, not to believe that is a real step of faith. Mm -hmm. Now, before we close, I, I can't help but mention the preface to your book, <laughs> yeah. which is entitled, An Ironic Thing Happened on yeah. the Way to Publication. Right. What happened to you that made <laughs> you really, really need your own book? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, uh, when I wrote the book, I was a, a professor at Duke Divinity School, and uh, which was great. I loved it. it was a, great location, great opportunity. Uh, we were very comfortable uh, and uh, nice house, easy drive to work, <laughs> everything going for it. Um, so I wasn't looking to, to go anywhere. We expected to retire and stay in Durham, uh, North Carolina. Uh, finished the book and then just weeks afterward had a call from a recruiter talking to me about the, uh, the deanship at Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University. And Oh, okay, you know, initially reluctant, but they began to talk about what they wanted and what they were looking for. And the more we talked, the more it seemed like, well, may, you know, maybe this is a call, maybe this is something I, I meant to do. Uh, and ultimately, they convinced me of that. But of course, then it, that is in, creates an interesting problem in terms of talking about a book about ambition and so forth. Indeed, uh, it would. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to acknowledge that up front uh, and say that. So you know, in a sense, the book is written as much or more for me uh, initially than for anyone else, and to, to remind me continually that uh, I need to serve God, but not deceive myself while I'm doing it about the nature and the complexity of my own motives uh, and so forth. And I think the, the more, particularly in the church, you are recognized and the more prominent your position is, in a way, the more dangerous it is for you. Uh, it's very easy to pretend you're better than you really are and uh, you're holier and more righteous than you really are. And uh, this is why uh, God gives us spouses and children, I think, to <laughs> keep reminding us that that's not really true. Uh, or, well, in my case, maybe faculties. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's exciting, it's a wonderful challenge, but uh, actually one of the things about that, too, is I had uh, a few times in the book had mentioned seminary deans, and I didn't want to delete those, expunge those from the record. Uh, so that's part of why I wrote that preface. I didn't want anyone to think when I talked about deans I was talking about myself, <laughs> because that really was the furthest thing from my mind when I when I wrote the book originally. Yeah. So. Well, congratulations on the appointment. No, well, thank you. Congratulations on the new book, and thank you for it. It's oh, of course. full of a lot of wisdom. Oh, well, thanks. Well, it was a long time in coming. <laughs> uh, well, just not so much in life, but just for reflecting on the New Testament over many years yeah. and seeing those patterns that were there. And I hope, I hope a lot of people find it helpful. I'm certain they will. No, thank you. Mm -hmm.